Let's start off with our first question, Dr. Kevabu. Okay, you mind if I jump right in? Hi, how are you? I haven't heard you speak yet, so sorry. <laughs> All good? I'm all good. No, okay. yeah. Sorry, Stephanie. Yeah, all good. I'm listening and I had myself on mute, so I apologize. No problem. Not at all. Away? Thank you so much. So we'll take some questions from our community that we had before from the first webinar. And then for those of you who have questions, feel free to raise your hand and you can ask yourself. Or if you're a little more shy, feel free to just type them in the chat function and I'll go ahead and read them, okay? So we'll get started with the question that was submitted beforehand. Our daughter has an SDHB uh, paraganglioma tumor in uh, her carotid artery. And when that was found, also a parotid uh, gland tumor was also found next to it. Um, in a year, the carotid tumor has grown from 12 to 14. Is either necessary to remove? Any chance they're connected? And if removed, what are the expected after effects? Um, that's a really big question, but, um, but if you can give it your best shot um, in a limited amount of time, that would be great. Yes. Yeah. So, and if I'm correct, it's an SDHB as a boy. Correct. So, yeah. So, you know, um, you may or may not know when there's an SDHB mutation, the risk of it being malignant metastatic is higher. Um, and you know, the carotid body tumors are high stakes procedures. Why do I say that? The complications that could occur from trying to remove it are pretty significant. You know, it could result in a, a stroke. Um, so we really need to be deliberate. And it sounds like it's, you said your daughter, a, a young person, um, and a change of 12 to 14, I assume is in millimeters. So it's still below two centimeters. Uh, that's usually used to be in the past, our threshold of whether to remove a carotid body tumor. Uh, but work that you know we did in collaboration with other investigators, what we found is you know, that two centimeter threshold didn't actually apply to patients with SDHB mutation. Why do I say that? Uh, we found even at smaller tumor size that they had additional tumors or it had spread. So my practice now, you know, I haven't seen your daughter, there's many other things to consider what to make of the parotid tumors, but certainly if it was my daughter, I would recommend if it's an SDHB mutation, there's a tumor present in the carotid body that it be removed. You know, something like 15 or 16% of the patients had the tumor come back or had it spread when they had an SDHB mutation. So I've actually changed my practice. All other mutations or unknown, you know, family history usually watch until it's two centimeters. Another advantage of getting it removed while it's smaller is in that study that we did, the complication rate of the procedure was directly related to how big the tumor was. So better remove it at 14, 16 millimeters than when it's two and a half centimeters because then the risk of the procedure or risk of complication is higher. Now your question about the parotid tumor, I'm not aware of any literature that there's a direct link. It might be true and true, unrelated, a coincidental finding uh, that's not necessarily related to, you know, pheochromocytoma and the paraganglioma. I hope that was helpful. In yes, that. thank you. Um, and I also just want to reinforce going back to your previous webinar that aired a few weeks ago, because there was some really useful information specific to genetic mutations and surgery um, that I personally learned a lot. Um, if anybody is interested in asking a question, feel free to either raise your hand or enter it in the chat. Um, I am here and ready and willing to have you all uh, participate. I'll go on to the next question. Um, that, let's see, this is regarding a metastatic um, situation. It's, under, it's my understanding that once you do surgery on an organ liver, it is very hard to do again. Are there any other options for cancer that has spread? Yes, no, thank you for that question. Um, the, answer, the short answer to your question is yes. There are multiple, multiple options, and really it depends upon the size of the tumor that's come back or spread to the liver, as well as the number of tumors that are present and whether they're on both sides of the liver. We normally have a left lobe of the liver and a right lobe. Uh, the usual best 
treatment is to remove it. So a repeat operation in the liver is reasonable to consider. And why is that the best treatment? Well, we have the best information for that because we're able to remove all of the tumor surrounding normal tissue. And we know when we do that, people live a fairly long time without it coming back. So it's good to look at it, but sometimes that's not possible because there are many tumors, they're both sides of the liver. It would entail removing too much normal liver and we need our liver to live, okay? So what are the other options I, I was talking about? Well, you know, now we have cryoablation, radioablation. What is that? It's just simply putting a needle into the tumor and you freeze the tumor dead, all the tumor cells, or you, in the radiofrequency ablation, you cook the tumor to death. The recovery and the complication for that type of procedure is much, much better. Better, faster recovery, less pain than an operation. So sometimes, even if it's one small tumor, that might be actually the best treatment is to do an ablative, local ablative treatment at that site. The other level directed therapy is done by interventional radiologists where we go in and embolize the tumor, the blood vessel feeding the tumor to be able to live and grow. And that's a reasonable approach, again, if the number are reasonable and the tumors are smallish. So there are many, in addition to surgery, local ablative therapies that could be considered that specifically targeting the liver. I would say a strategy of removing or killing most of the tumor with the least side effect profile is generally the best way to approach things if a patient has a tumor in the liver. Great. Um, and as you kind of go through these questions, I think we discussed this before as well as the importance of a experienced field paramedical team, especially go, we, as we go down these very specific situations that um, it's really important to find that. And um, obviously, yeah. go ahead. No, I was going to say thank you for that, Stephanie. In fact, you know, every patient, you know, these two clinical questions I was asked, first, you know, I'm giving my opinion based on the information I have, but when we do make treatment decisions like that, we've had multiple providers seeing the patient, radiologists interpreting the imaging. We all meet at sort of a tumor board or a cl clinical conference. And we have that every other week or once a month where these sort of decisions are made as a group. And you need the expertise of everybody available to arrive at the best recommendation. So even I'm able to give you an answer, I would definitely encourage you to have your case or your child's case or your friend's case discussed at the tumor board because you'll get an additional perspective beyond a surgeon's uh, perspective. Great, thank you. And we have our own designated centers of excellence. That program just launched two years ago, as well as we know of the foremost players. So um, if you go to our website and you don't find a center near you, um, we can help find a center like Stanford and other such experience centers that may not be directly in your area, but we'll do our best to connect to you. And I know a lot of these docs are very willing to consult with the local team if that's the only option. Um, so we we have a group of passionate docs that are willing to help our patients regardless of where they are located. Um, okay, this is, this is uh, what is the percentage of recurrence based on demographics, race and gender specifically for a bladder para? Yes, you know, I always, uh, when I get a question like that, um, if let's say the rate is 5% and if I see 100 patients, and I say the same thing to patients. And if you're five of those patients that had a recurrence, it's 100%. Right. That 95, they would have been worried and anxious for no good reason, okay? So I don't think to answer your question, we have an exact precise number based on, you know, is it a woman or a man? Uh, what is the, background of the, if there is any germline mutation. Um, thus, generally though, the bladder periganglioma's have a higher risk of being cancerous. 
And I would say that rate of it coming back uh, in the same area, and this is looking at, again, it just might not apply to your specific situation, should be less than 10%. Perhaps the best studies that have done followed people up to 30 years out from removal, and the rate was anywhere from 8 to 10%, if I recall correctly. So less than 10%, I would say. But to me, the more important thing is you get the follow-up every year because you don't know which group you're going to be in. If you have a recurrence, well, clearly it was 100%. Yeah, um, I want to get, I would like to get all our passionate field paradox, a t-shirt that says it depends and <laughs> just point to it because that is the case with field chromocytoma and paraganglioma and, and it depends. Um, uh, let's see, we have a question from our chat here. Um, adrenal medullary hyperplasia can be a precursor to FIO. Um, can you please comment on treatment of AMH? AMH, if someone has been diagnosed with unilateral, unilateral AMH with no known mutations, evidenced by intense abnormal focal uptake on MIBG scan, slightly enlarged adrenal, elevated METs, um, signs and symptoms consistent with FIO, what course of recommendation do you recommend? Yes, uh, that, that's a very interesting situation. And, you know, maybe we're recognizing it more when people have borderline testing values for the biochemistry. Uh, and we do an MIBG, and there's maybe a little bit more uptake. Now, I say that because if we're just learning more about it, to me, less is more. That is watchful waiting and seeing if this is going to be anything significant. You know, in my career of taking care of patients with pheochrosencytoma and paraganglioma, I've really only seen adrenal medullary hyperplasia become clinically significant in patients with MEN2, a germline ret oncogene mutation, or VHL. Everything else, I am very meticulous in following patients, but loath to act on just adrenal medullary happier pleasure. So I would say watchful waiting, and I don't think you need to repeat scans or at least CT scans with radiation exposure every year. I think biochemistries and then seeing if that's increasing or you become symptomatic, then doing the imaging studies and seeing if there's something new that's uh, developed. So I think just watchful waiting is really the best approach in most people without a germline mutation. Okay, um, uh, maybe related, but um, a separate question from a separate individual, but how can I manage symptoms? Um, and they had catecholamines in, in parentheses without opting for surgery. Uh, you know, you know I, I think uh, we've had many patients uh, with metastatic disease that we cannot help with removing with surgery or did not respond to chemotherapy or did not respond to PRT, that I've been very surprised that have been on phenoxybezin or doxyzosin. So a, a good strategy in those patients that have functional metastatic uh, tumor is to put them on antihypertensive, but to manage those symptoms and a significant number of patients, the alpha blockade really impacted uh, their symptoms. So those are, I think, the two main ways uh, we can manage patient symptoms, but it's no guarantee it'll work for you. But I, I've seen a fair number of patients that had a reasonable response and really had a high tumor burden. Uh, so I think that's a reasonable strategy uh, and increase the dose if it's not working serially get until you get to the point where you feel like your symptoms are well managed. Okay. Um, a pretty specific question, but maybe we can talk in um, regards to this question, but also just more in regards to if, um, let's see, I have a, a rare para three quarters of a centimeter in the diaphragm retroperitoneal region attached to the aorta. Is the only way to access this by opening up the full body and deflating the lung, et cetera, to access? What determines if it is operable? Yeah, so, uh, and I see Jessica, I think we'll have you ask the next question. I saw you raise your hand. Thank you. Thank Definitely you. Has a, is monitoring Thank you. the chat. So I, I think it depends whether if it's in the chest or abdomen. If it's in the abdomen, uh, I actually use this procedure. It's a retroperitoneal procedure that we could come in from the back. 
Uh, and most of these are very quite easily removed, five centimeters on the bigger side. Uh, so that's a possibility. If it's in the chest, um, you know, we usually have our thoracic surgeons. Uh, if we have a patient that we need to discuss with a chest paraganglioma, participate in our tumor board, and they usually could approach it with a minimally invasive approach, um, incisions the width of my pinky, and they deflate the lung just during the procedure. It's not a permanent collapsation. So there's space and then they remove it and then they're able to. So it really depends and then re-expand the lung. So it really depends whether it's in the chest or abdomen, but there are uh, several approaches from the back and in the chest from the side that are minimally invasive, but your specific case would need to be discussed with all those uh, disciplines involved to determine what's the optimal procedure. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Jessica for your question. Oh, thank you. Um, so thanks for doing this, by the way. I really appreciate it. Um, so my question is kind of specific. It's related to my daughter. She's 22 and she has MEN2A and she had one adrenal gland removed already when she was nine and it was a six centimeter tumor, um, the PO was, and now she's 22 and has about a two centimeter PO. Um, and then they did the PET Dota Tate scan and it appears that it's metastasized to her aortal, aortal cable, I'm reading all this, um, lymph node. And then looks like there's five spots in the lungs as well that are smaller. Um, I was just curious what your thoughts are for treatment and as of now, we're, she's planning on having the other adrenal band removed and then trying to get that affected lymph node if possible, and then kind of go from there. But we don't really have a plan after that. So I didn't know, just curious. Yeah, so that's, uh, I'm sorry to hear that. It's a tricky situation though in MEN2A because you know the dotatate that's lighting up or suggesting something in the abdomen or in the lung Remember, I don't know if she has a history of medullary thyroid cancer, but the medullary, yeah. I'm sorry? She had that removed when she was three. Yeah, yeah. early. So I worry though that it might be medullary thyroid cancer. So the first thing I would do is do the blood test for calcitonin and CEA and make sure it's not elevated because for pheochromocytomas, you know, lung metastases are rare. From medullary thyroid cancer, it's much more common. So that's number one. If it is from the pheochromocytoma though, um, I, I think removing the two centimeters is not too big. You know, yeah. if in a young person, I try to leave as much normal adrenal gland behind as possible. And the reason is to avoid the need for steroid replacement, okay? Sure. If it's possible, that should be done. And then, you know, the areas that light up on the dotatate in the abdomen could be removed. And then you're only left with the question, are these lung nodules that light up on dotatate from medullary thyroid cancer or from a pheochromocytoma? And you could retest for the normadinephrine and metanephrine. If that's back to normal, then uh -huh. it's, and the calcitonin is level, is high, then that's probably medullary thyroid cancer. But the take home message is wherever it's from, you have a reasonable treatment option because you already know it lights up on the dota tape, right? Okay, so yeah. You could do PRRT. And if it's medullary thyroid cancer, there's three FDA approved medications that are pretty effective as well. Okay, okay, okay. So, that's good. Yeah, those will be kind of the two avenues I would pursue and then decide, okay, this is the best option on what we think is spread to the lung. Okay. So if her, they did do calcitonin, it was high, but not as high as they would think if it were medullary. So, okay. but I guess you still aren't. If, still was it not, in the hundreds? No. It, no, it was in the fifties no. or two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. a tough one because it should be undetectable. If all of the um, thyroid was removed in childhood, I have plenty of patients. I followed, you know, two, three decades. It should yeah. be undetectable because there is no source for it. So in my mind, I'm still hesitant, uh, but okay. you know, if you can't tease it out, then you definitely have treatment options with PRRT once everything that can be removed is removed. Okay, thank you so much. 
Uh, Jessica, if you have a follow-up question, you're welcome to ask away. Dr. Kebabu has done a great job of uh, answering these rapid fire questions and anybody else who wants to jump in as well too. Yeah, I don't want to interrupt. I mean, I do have another one, but if Go other ahead. people have. Go ahead. Um, well, I was just curious, do you do telehealth uh, appointments? Yeah, we do telehealth, telemedicine appointments. You know, okay. with COVID, um, that has changed a great deal. Uh, yeah. where we could do it from out of state a lot. Now that it, that's changed that you need to be in state. Uh, oh, okay. So if you're out of state, I think the best thing I could do for you, and Stephanie said this earlier, I am happy to review the records and okay. give you my thought via phone or just a Zoom appointment without this being you know, medical care, but just me offering you my opinion. Oh, wow. Okay. That's so wonderful. <laughs> Thank I, you so I much. I think that's what we're here for. So yeah. I, the Theo Care oh. Alliance has, I think, a vehicle of doing that, right, Stephanie? Yeah. Can, yeah. Can, well, um, Jessica, if you just reach out to me, I'm happy to put you in touch with Dr. Kevabu. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, one more question, and I saw that look in Jessica's eye when you like see somebody and, and hear something that, you know, you're excited about for your child. And that's, it's so, so wonderful to see that, yeah. that look on your face <laughs> when you talk to somebody yeah. who knows what they're it's talking hard. about. <laughs> it's hard to find. It is. Yeah. All right. This question is from Will. Um, D-H-E-A-S, what is the value in checking this level during adrenal workup? And if elevated, the implications, especially if the levels normalized following adrenalectomy? Yes, that's a terrific question. Uh, DHEA is a steroid uh, that is secreted from the cortical portion of the adrenal gland. So there's two portions of the adrenal gland, the cortical, the cortex, and the medulla. The pheochromocytomas grow from the medulla, the cortical tumors, it's the cortex, and the DHEA comes from the cortex. But sometimes when people have an adrenal tumor, we don't know, is this a pheochromocytoma or is it another type of functional adrenal tumor that could come from the cortex? So that is the two reasons we check it. Now we check it if it's elevated, it's also a marker in some studies for adrenal cancer, which arises from the adrenal cortex. Some people from the adrenal tumor also could have a high steroid level and that's called Cushing's. So that DHEA is helpful if we're worried about is this Cushing's because it will be suppressed. So those are the two main medical reasons we check the DHEA in a patient with an adrenal tumor. A, do they have overfunction of steroid from that tumor or is it potentially cancerous and this is elevated level that we could use to monitor subsequently after the adrenal tumor is removed that it's not coming back. I hope that answered your question. Um, Will will let us know in the chat if, okay. if he has follow-up questions. Um, I'll just take a moment real quick to mention that all of this information is for educational purposes only. And um, uh, to get the full picture, you, I, we recommend you see an experienced FIO paramedical team who knows all of your history. Um, special thanks to Progenix for sponsoring uh, the entire education webinar series, including this Q&A session. Um, if we do have time for one more question, if anybody has a question that they're interested in getting answered, um, we have a few minutes left. We actually went through all of our questions, which is amazing. All right, Dr. Kebabu, you have three minutes to get to your next meeting. <laughs> all right. Well, it's, thank you, Stephanie. And it's great to meet all of you. And I hope the answers were helpful and always available if you need input in a non-medical setting and just review records via the Theo Para Alliance. Okay. So grateful. So grateful. Thank you, thank you so much for your have time. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.